All right, so in this case, torque. So torque is defined as your perpendicular force times your lever arm. So in R here, sometimes some textbooks and pressures, we use the letter L. Instead, your textbook uses the letter R. So we're gonna go with the letter R in this case. So, but torque. So we have a bunch of analogous things here uh, to what we learn in translational motion. So what's Newton's second law? Yeah, F equals MA. So it turns out, if I have, let's say, two boxes on an ice rink, and I have this big box, and I have this little box, and the big box is way more massive, aka more mass, than the little box, if I go to slide these across the ice, so which one is it harder to impart a given acceleration to? The bigger one. Yeah, higher mass, it's just harder to give it you know, the same acceleration as a small one, I have to use a much larger force to accomplish that. So in a rotational sense, that's what torque accomplishes. So torque is analogous to force, but in a rotational sense. Instead of getting something to move, I'm gonna get something to rotate. So, and the more torque, the more force to cause something to rotate, so to speak. So it's not quite the same thing as force, but it's analogous in a rotational sense. But instead of mass here, we have what's called the moment of inertia. And instead of acceleration, we have angular acceleration. And so we get the sum of the torques adds up to I alpha. So in this case, something that is more massive is harder to get sliding along to give a given acceleration. Something that has a higher moment of inertia is gonna be harder to impart a certain given rotational acceleration to. So if you look at a typical ice skater, so, and they're doing their spin. So, and if they wanna spin really fast, what do they do? They, uh, close their Yeah, arms. they tuck in their arms and legs. So, and it turns out that changes their moment of inertia. And by changing their moment of inertia, so we'll find out it's actually gonna be conservation of angular momentum in a little bit, but by changing their moment of inertia, it's easier to rotate, and so they rotate faster. So, and in this case, they actually lower their moment of inertia, which allows them to increase their angular velocity. So in the same sense though, if something has a smaller moment of inertia, you can give it an angular acceleration more easily as well. It doesn't require as much torque to accomplish. Cool, so same thing. Uh, we're gonna see a lot of variables that kind of have an angular equivalent today. So, so far mass is moment of inertia, keep that in mind. Typically the way that works with moment of inertia is the more concentrated something has its mass towards the axis rotation, the lower the moment of inertia, the further that mass is spread out away from the axis of rotation, the greater, and oftentimes with point masses, we say that you can add up all the mr squareds, so the mass times the radius or distance from the axis of rotation squared, add up all those terms of all the different point masses, and you can get a moment of inertia. Now this is for point masses. It turns out for you know, any kind of different shaped object rotating, it'll have a different moment of inertia. So if I take this marker, if I rotate it this way versus rotate it this way versus rotate it this way, all of those would have different moments of inertia. And you by all means do not have to memorize those. They're gonna be given to you on a table and things of a sort. But whether you have a hollow sphere, a solid sphere, a solid cylinder, a hollow cylinder, they're all gonna have a little bit different formula uh, for the moment of inertia. And typically if you need it, it's totally gonna be given to you. Um, is there, like, so because I know that they have to like half or two or one or one or one twelfth or one yeah. sixth or yep. Is there a reason why one is bigger than the other one? So totally, shapes? totally. Let's let's look a couple things. In fact, we're going to do that first. Why don't we just jump into that since that's your question? So if you look at question number one, so we're talking about which of the following has the greatest moment of inertia. So we have a solid wood sphere. So it's a sphere, not a circle, but a sphere. So, and a hollow gold sphere. So, and we're told that they have the equal mass and equal radius. And so, would they have the same moment of inertia? The first one, the wooden one, would be more concentrated? It's more concentrated towards the center, center so it would be a, a lower. lower moment of inertia. Yes, awesome. So, but same mass, same radius. Obviously, I drew this one a little bigger, but it's supposed to be the same mass and radius. So, and this one has more mass concentrated towards the center. This one has more mass concentrated towards the edge. This is the one that's gonna be harder to get to give a, a certain angular acceleration. So, it's got a higher moment of inertia, just like analogous to having a larger mass. It's harder to give it an acceleration. So this one, with the gold all concentrated to the edge, with a higher moment of inertia, it's gonna be harder to get it rotating. Once they start to rotate them, maybe it's easier to maintain because 
Well, it's not about maintaining, because notice, you know, once I get a box sliding, assuming this is frictionless, it would just slide forever. Yeah. It would already have a certain inertia. Yeah. So unless a force opposes it, it's not going to stop. Same thing here. Now, notice once I get it rotating, I think what you might be alluding to is it's harder to stop because it's got a lot more angular momentum. Same thing here. Which box, if I give them the same acceleration for a given time and then I let go, they're just going to move at constant velocity after that. But the big one, if I get them to the same acceleration, the big one have a lot more momentum and would take much greater impulse to stop. Okay. Momentum and inertia. What's the difference? So remind me, what is linear momentum? Mass times velocity. Mass oh. times velocity. So it's a combination of how big you are, how massive you are, and how fast you're moving. Okay. And so notice if I have a semi-truck mm -hmm. and a Volkswagen moving at the same velocity, which one's harder to stop? Semi-truck, because it has way more momentum. So what we're going to learn later, and I'll just allude to it now, angular momentum. Instead of mass, we have moment of inertia. And instead of velocity, we have angular velocity. So, but it's going to be the same way. And so the one with, if I get these both rotating with a certain acceleration alpha, right. and then I let go, mm -hmm. they would at that point have a constant rotational velocity, angular velocity. So, and this one would be harder to stop. Mm -hmm. With a larger inertia, it would end up with a larger angular momentum and it would be harder to stop. Cool. Mm -hmm. All right, so if you notice, you've also got the one on your handout here. So you've got a cylinder of sorts and you can rotate it either about the, an axis right down the center of it or we could rotate it around an axis all the way around one edge, in which case would we have a greater moment of inertia? Uh, the edge. Yeah, so in this case, with actually let's go to the center one, more of the mass is concentrated towards the axis of rotation in this case, and so it would have a lower moment of inertia, easier to give a certain acceleration alpha, but the one where we're rotating it about its end, more mass concentrated away from the axis of rotation. Cool. Okay, so let's go back to torque for a minute. We're going to spend a little more time on torque. So torque, perpendicular force, or the perpendicular component of the force to the lever arm here. So if I have this lovely crescent wrench or adjustable wrench here, if I want to turn and rotate a bolt, so where do I want to press on this lovely wrench? The very end. The very end. What happens if I press here and try and turn it? You're going to use more force. I'm going to use way more force. So because it turns out, your torque you generate is related to the lever arm, which is related to the distance of how far you're applying that force away from the actual axis of rotation. So and in this case, would it help to turn this thing if I pushed parallel with the wrench itself? No, I want to push as perpendicular as possible. And so in this case, it's only the perpendicular component of the force is one way to look at it. So that actually operates and generates the torque. So if we look then, we could summarize this by saying F sine theta times r, where theta here is the angle between your force and your lever arm. So in this case, we're going to see some problems where we deal with opening a door here in a minute. So in this case, where do I want to push on this door to generate the most torque? All the way down at the end. So, and in which case, if these are the force uh, directions, in which case would we generate the most torque, assuming these all have the same magnitude? perpendicular one. And so in this case, with the perpendicular one, so our force and our lever arm are 90 degrees apart. What's the sine of 90? Exactly. And so the sine of 90 being 1, we just get F times R. So that's the easiest case. Great. So I don't know if you've ever worked a whole lot with wrenches and bolts and stuff like that but sometimes no matter how hard you crank on this thing the wrench is not adequate so they make available these lovely things so any idea what this is this is a breaker bar so and you'll put a socket on the end of this that'll go over the bolt and now i can generate a lot more torque to get that bolt loose and why can't i generate a lot more torque much longer lever arm. Excellent.